Hello and welcome to the Canon Reviewed, a podcast that looks at old books with new eyes and examines their continued relevance to contemporary readers. I'm your host, Daniel, and I'm delighted that you're here. So please, pull up a chair by the fire, and we'll begin our discussion of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. I want to say right now that I don't plan on talking too much about the biographies and backstories of the texts we'll be looking at on this podcast. I think the literature should be able to stand on its own and is most fairly treated when examined as a single entity rather than a byproduct of something else. Sometimes, the life of an author might matter to some degree to our understanding of a book, but it's not a well I'll be dipping into too often. The Scarlet Letter was published in 1850, and by all accounts, Nathaniel Hawthorne seems like he was a cool guy who wrestled with his own religiosity and his ancestors' harsh way of viewing it. So, the exploration of how one can believe in God but not be a Puritan was a pretty genuine one for him. He was a moral searcher, deeply interested in the treatment and definition of sin, possessed a somewhat grim view of human nature. As a Bostonian, he was fascinated by the history of his town, especially the puritanical roots of it and his own family's involvement in it. And many consider this novel a piece of historical fiction. The setting and its inhabitants are horrifyingly real enough, that's for sure. Okay, so what happens in the book? Well, let's imagine it like a movie. It's how I see novels in my head, and it's kind of the only way I know how to explain it. The camera focuses tightly on a beautiful rose, holds momentarily, and slowly zooms out. We now see the rose bush stands, out of place, next to an iron-banded wooden prison door. This incongruity, or rather, this contrast between darkness and light, beauty and ugliness, natural freedom and stodgy rigidity, will come to drive the narrative. Soon, the sound of voices, and the camera zooms out further to reveal a crowd of plainly dressed Puritan folk gathered around the entrance of the prison. The gray faces of humorless women and clenched-jawed men squint meanly at the door. The women discuss punishment, degrees of torture, sufficient pain and suffering for the crimes of the sinful creature imprisoned. A few younger folk try to talk about grace, forgiveness, but they are sneered down by their elders. A guard turns the key, and it groans to opening. The prison door revealing the darkness without depth within. What emerges from that cell defies the joyless mob's expectations. Like the rose, she blooms forth from the dungeon, pale face, dark-haired, and defiantly beautiful. It is Hester Pring, and in her arms, a baby. The crowd almost gasps as she holds herself up, proud and powerful. There are so many things for the scolds and naysayers to examine, but their collective eyes are drawn to the letter stitched upon the bosom of her dress, a scarlet A, worked beautifully and embroidered with golden thread. The letter, meant to be a very public symbol of her crime and her shame, jumps off her dress. Its crafting is exquisite and seems almost an insult to the authority that demanded its placement. In the awestruck silence, a woman is heard to mutter, well, she has some skill with a needle, I'll give her that. Hester Prynne, chin up, but clutching the baby so tightly it cries, makes her way through the crowd. The sallow Puritans follow in her wake as she is led to the gallows in the center of town. With heavy steps, Hester climbs the stage and turns to meet the crowd. 
challenging each to meet her gaze. They cannot. Above her, on a balcony overlooking the market square, the patriarchs of Boston peer down solemnly and with great austerity. There's the governor with his stiff hat and furred collar. The town's venerable and aged pastor stands beside him. Slightly behind each of them, a younger man, pouty and meek, but with almost girlish good looks, bends his head towards heaven, seeking strength from his God. This is Arthur Dimsdale, the young minister and shepherd to this joyless flock. The two older gentlemen turn to him and motion him forward to once again appeal to the soul of Hester Prynne. He calls down to Hester, his voice resonant but soft. He asks her the same question he has before, that they've all asked her before. She stares up at him defiantly, almost seeming to pity the young preacher. Hester, he calls down, you need not stand in shame alone. That baby is proof that two exist who have committed this crime. For God and for your soul, I charge you to speak the name of your fellow sinner, your fellow sufferer. By your silence, you can only tempt him to add hypocrisy to sin. You're lucky. You get to deal with this all in the open, but you're denying him. A man who clearly does not possess the courage to grasp it himself. The bitter but wholesome cup presented to your lips. A silence falls over the market. The populace bend forward in hope. Perhaps they'll finally have the good fortune of another to castigate and demean. Then, Hester. Never! I will endure my agony as well as his. Okay, then. Dimsdale backs up and allows his superiors the chance to threaten and cajole her. But Hester will not speak. Again, she looks defiantly into the crowd, and as she scans the faces of the members of her community, her eyes fall on an older man standing by himself at the edge of the green. Her eyes widen in both recognition and horror. But before she can cry out, the man slowly puts his finger to his lips. It's creepy as hell. Just then, an appeal from above makes her look away, and when she peers out again, the man is gone. Since she will not speak the name of the baby's father, she is led back to the prison and once again confined. Soon, a doctor is called in to administer to the crying child. It's the same man, stooped and somewhat misshapen, hideous in a way to behold that she saw in the green the one who cautioned her to silence. So you're going to poison us, Hester asks, looking at the flasks of liquid in the man's hand. He looks down at Hester with a mixture of sympathy and disdain, maybe even love? Foolish woman, says he, how could I hurt a baby? This is strong medicine, and even were it my child, mine and yours, I could offer it nothing better. She trusts him, and soon her child is fast asleep. In the quiet of the cell, he struggles to sit down in front of her. I won't ask how or why I found you like this today. It's pretty clear. You're weak, and I was an idiot to think you could ever love me. I... An old nerd wrapped up in my studies and board games, and you, beautiful, young. What was I thinking? I was always truthful with you, says Hester. You know I didn't love you. Sure, but I thought after a while you'd see my charms. And I was so desperate to not be lonely that I let myself cling to hope. I thought if I loved you enough, it would be love enough for us both. I hurt you, says Hester softly. We hurt each other, but I hurt you first. I ruined your youth, tied you to my decaying old form, let you marry me when you didn't want to. What? Yes, this decrepit old man is Hester's true husband, and she hasn't seen him in two years. In fact, 
All evidence pointed to his being dead. He sent her to Boston before him, was to follow within the year, but the ship that carried him across sank and all on board were feared lost. But, Hester, there exists someone who has wronged us both. No, don't ask me. Okay, but I'm going to devote the rest of my life to his discovery, and there's nothing that can remain hidden to someone so dedicated to solving a mystery. The two go back and forth for a while, but in the end they come to a strange agreement. He promises not to hurt or accuse the father of the child upon discovery, and she accepts his demand to not disclose his true identity. From here on, he is no longer Mr. Prynne, but Roger Chillingworth. Before he leaves, she admits to feelings of terror that he has come to somehow ruin her soul. Not your soul, Chillingworth wheezes. No, not yours. Now, we have a fairly lengthy montage of Hester's life once she's released from prison. The town despises her, especially the women. But this doesn't mean they won't use her or exploit her generosity. She becomes the town tailor and all admire her work in private while in public and to her face, they demean her for her adultery. She carries on nobly. Aside from sewing and such, we also see Hester's child, a young girl, grow from infancy to impish youth, and the montage ends where the girl, named Pearl, turns seven. Hester has heard that the town elders, all men, are busy deciding whether or not to allow her to keep her child. To their way of thinking, here's the problem. A child, conceived in sin, such as Pearl was, is most likely half-devil, and therefore, if she is to be brought up correctly and in the ways of the good book, then an adulteress is in no way fit for the task. Hester, hearing of this, marches to the governor's house to appeal her claim to Pearl. She goes about it in a pretty interesting way. She is my torture, my daily reminder of sin, says Hester, but also my only path to atonement. Take her, and I will die. Well, this initial plea meets uh, the unsurprisingly stony faces of the magistrates. But then Hester notices young Reverend Dimsdale among the bunch and turns to him. You, she says, you have sympathies these other men lack, please. Just then Hester notices behind him is her husband, Chillingworth. And it turns out that he has become Dimsdale's personal physician since the young man is ailing from some mysterious illness. More on that later. So, Dimsdale turns to the other men and begins babbling about the sacred relationship between mother and child. He also talks about how happy Hester gets to be because this symbol of sin is out in the open for her. But the father must be suffering since this blessing isn't allowed him. Yes, the girl may be a daily reminder of her sin, but Pearl has come from God's grace. And who are these mere mortals to interfere with that? He's quite passionate, and his pale, girlish face lights up. Chillingworth notices this, too, and is quite taken by his charge's earnestness. He says as much. Suddenly, little Pearl, usually not given to outbursts of sentimentality, kisses Dimsdale's hand. Weird kid, Chillingworth remarks. I see the mom in her for sure, but don't you think someone could study her and figure out who the daddy is? Nah, that would be sinful, he is told. Now, we cut to Act 2 of the novel, and here we begin to see the vile doctor's machinations as he attempts to cure his desperate patient. Chillingworth concocts all sorts of potions and stuff, but nothing's working to ease the minister's restless mind and heart. So, Chillingworth tries a little psychiatry on the guy. You know, sometimes it's better to talk about something. You seem like you got some soul troubles, because it isn't physical, my dear friend. Tell me. What's going on with you? Dimsdale protests and protests that he has nothing to say in that department, that he is simply unwell. Oh, and it's kind of rude to pry like Chillingworth is. Well, Chillingworth's suspicions are aroused by this. He's never seen anyone act like this before, especially not the guy 100% in charge of the souls of a congregation. 
Those folks are supposed to be the purest and bestest of them all. Something is definitely up with this guy. He thinks he knows what it is. All he needs is confirmation. And, in time, he gets it. When he stumbles upon Dimsdale asleep on a chair with his shirt open, and there it is. Chillingworth has his proof. Got you. It is psychological. The good minister is tortured by guilt and hypocrisy. Chillingworth is triumphant, but he's not going to turn him in. No, he knows that what Dimsdale is suffering now is tons worse than public shame to a guy like him. So let him stew. One day, Hester and Pearl are walking in the woods when they stumble upon Dimsdale who's out on a pouty stroll. At first, Pearl thinks he's the devil, and that's kind of symbolic. Hester and Arthur meet up, look awkwardly around. They have an impossibly rare private moment. Hester, upon confirming that he remembers saying that he kind of liked her, confesses to him who Chillingworth is, and that he most likely knows the truth of it all. Dimsdale's pissed, and he's like, I'll never forgive you, never. Hester pleads with him. I have a lot more to say about this in episode 3. And he eventually relents and moves on to new horrors. What's Chillingworth going to do? Tell on them? He seems like a child caught in a prank. Hester, knowing her husband pretty well, understands his secretive and creepy nature and thinks he'll probably do something else to get back at him. Well, that freaks Dimsdale out so much that he decides to bravely flee Boston in the dead of night and start a new life elsewhere. Alone. No, says Hester, not alone. And the two contrive to flee by boat together the next day. Dimsdale leaves to basically hallucinate and sleepwalk in a kind of bizarre confession that no one believes because he's so darn perfect, as Hester realizes she's never been happier and no longer requires the symbol on her dress since her life has been, basically, sanctified. She unpins the letter, chucks it into the woods. She beams down at her little girl only to find Pearl staring up at her mother in horror. Who is this woman before? Where's the scarlet letter? Hester, just freshly breathing the beautiful air of freedom, once again fastens the letter to her dress and returns to her old self. Nevertheless, renewed that she will be escaping and starting her life over. Okay, now let's quickly move to the end. On the day of departure, Hester is surprised to see Dimsdale looking out of sorts more than his usual dreamy ways manifesting in his walk and mood. It's a holiday, and the whole town is out and about. Dimsdale makes his way to the scaffold and calls the populace to attend to him. Oh, crap, Hester thinks, because she knows in her heart that Dimsdale couldn't possibly go on with the plan since his heart is so riddled with guilt. Sure enough, Dimsdale begins to confess everything. Every time he says he's a sinner, it's just further proof to all gather that the guy is a saint. So, pissed off by this because he wants everyone to know what a weak, vacillating hypocrite he is, he whips off his shirt, revealing the evidence, which we'll talk about next week, of his crime. Lord, it looks like Arthur Dimsdale is dying. Chillingworth rushes to the stage to stop him, but it's too late. The deed is done. You escaped me, he whispers, sneers into Dimsdale's ear. You escaped me. This was the only way you could have done it. Dimsdale smiles weakly at him and tells him he could probably use some forgiveness too. Pearl runs up and kisses Dimsdale's forehead, and with that, the minister expires. Everyone's freaked out, and they simply can't really explain what happened when they later try to recall the whole incident. Well, Hester and Pearl go across the sea to start anew, though Hester never once takes off the letter. Pearl marries well and is happy, and Hester returns to Boston many years later to die and be buried alongside Dimsdale. The thoughtful townsfolk even inscribed the letter A on her tombstone. Okay, so that was a quick summary, or maybe not so quick, depending. And in my paraphrasing, I purposefully left out a lot of important stuff. And in the coming episodes, I promise to be less vague, and I'll get more into the weeds about the book's four central characters. For now, though, let's take a look at the important themes in The Scarlet Letter, for it's through those channels that we can ask whether or not the book remains relevant to study. Well... There's a number of important engaging themes in The Scarlet Letter. I think this book is primarily about religious hypocrisy, gender inequities, and a patriarchal control over the lives of women. 
This book was written in 1850, about 1650, and here, almost 200 years later, these three main themes remain, sadly, relevant. One of the great uses of historical fiction is to blast the past for all of its problems when really what you're doing is talking about your own time and place, veiling it as thinly or not as you'd like. Poking fun at Puritans is fun and all, but it's pretty clear that Hawthorne was commenting on the regressive nature of religious conservatism of his own time. Dimsdale, somehow regarded as a hero by readers of this book, is a hypocritical weasel, too weak to do anything but allow Hester to take all the blame and all the social stigmatization for their shared crime, one that probably wasn't as big a deal in Hawthorne's time, or if it was, it would seem outdated, maybe. And it's this hypocrisy that leads to the theme of gender inequity that Hawthorne expertly examines and illuminates. It is the frailty of women that leads to Hester's exploitation by the devil. That she becomes the single token of sin and shame in this story is outlandish. Hawthorne doesn't hold back on what he thinks of Dimsdale, but he is actually more interested in skewering the whole town for their blind faith and adoration of Dimsdale. Even when he confesses at the end, it's just a sign of his saintly perfection. Ultimately, too, in their retelling of the scene, they even deny seeing the evidence on his chest. He's absolved of all wrongdoing so thoroughly that any connection to Hester Prynne that might have been suggested by the scene is gone. In fact, Dimsdale's story and his legacy becomes another sermon. His death, a parable meant to showcase where sinners all. The reverend exhausted his life in his efforts for mankind's spiritual good. Poor Dimsdale, who finally tries to do the right thing just way too late, is dealt a further blow by the reframing of his final act as one of virtue. Hawthorne doubles down on the hypocrisy, gender stuff, that this indicates with his incredible bit at the end, which, if we're being honest, could have been written yesterday. This version of Mr. Dimsdale's story is only an instance of that stubborn fidelity with which a man's friends, and especially a clergyman's, will sometimes uphold his character when proofs, clear as the midday sunshine on the scarlet letter, establish him a false and sin-stained creature of the dust. Without getting too political, Examples of ignoring the lies, peccadilloes, and offenses of our great men these days are rampant. Holding someone accountable when they're on your side is simply an impossible thing to ask. Hawthorne, thou callest up to us from the past. Finally, the patriarchy. Early on in the book, when Hester is on the scaffold looking up at the men above her, Hawthorne says something about the authority of judgment that has always reminded me of that, that government panel about women's health a few years ago that didn't have any women on it. A whole bunch of dudes who couldn't possibly imagine the lived experiences of the person they're talking about simply don't possess the wherewithal to say anything. Yet, they feel authorized to do so. Of Hester's tribunal, Hawthorne says this, They were, doubtless, good men, just and sage. But, out of the whole human family, it would not have been easy to select the same number of wise and virtuous persons who should be less capable of sitting in judgment on an erring woman's heart and disentangling its mesh of good and evil than the sages of rigid aspect towards whom Hester Prynne now turned her face. Before Dimsdale interfered on her behalf, Hester was in peril of losing her child simply because these lifeless old codgers knew better than she about motherhood, love, and the care and upbringing of her own child. What's interesting here is that Hawthorne never paints these old magistrates as comic figures. We're meant to take them seriously. The threat they pose to Hester's existence is very real. Well, now it's time to move the discussion over to thinking about what this book still brings to a contemporary and younger audience. Why should a first-time reader of the book care about it? Well, it's pretty cool as a historical document. Personally, I enjoy a good critique of the past 
and it shed some light on the puritanical roots of this country, and we see those roots clinging ferociously in some places still. It's not difficult to draw connections between then and now in regards to religious zealotry. What Hawthorne has to say in terms of social things like ostracization, punishment, and the individual capacity to both forgive and to move on, as well as the destructive nature of revenge, it's all pretty timeless as well. In the three main characters, we have, we have three separate models of how to move in and around society. Two unhealthy and one that's mm, pretty okay. Social drives and motivations, how we can blind ourselves to higher truths to dodge or fulfill our own aims. Most younger readers can understand and appreciate those things. Again, the social dynamics on display in the novel are eternal. Another thing worth discussing, and the topic itself is unquestionably polarizing, is whether or not this novel could be viewed as a pre-feminist text, whether Hester Prynne herself could be perceived as a kind of early feminist icon. There are arguments on both sides, and we'll be pursuing them further in episodes three and four. There is no doubt, however, that the political themes revolving around gender and equity carry forward well enough. The final thing going for this book is also related to one of the primary knocks against it. This book, in places, is outrageously funny. What Hawthorne says about the Puritans, about governance, and the way in which he perceives microscopically the foibles of his characters is often hilarious. Now, funny is good, right? So what's the problem? Well, now we need to start thinking about the things that might hold this book back in terms of continued relevance and reasons to keep reading it. So, turns out, things are only funny if you understand the joke, or the presentation of it. This is a book of these and thous, and man, can it go over the head of many younger readers. The humor and the story and all that would be totally accessible if the book weren't so old-timey sounding. All right, here's a comedic part, rendered somewhat insensible by the language in reference to the town doctor before Chillingworth showed up. At all events, the health of the good town of Boston, so far as medicine had aught to do with it, had hitherto lain in the guardianship of an aged deacon and apothecary whose piety and godly department were stronger testimonials in his favor than any that he could have produced in the ship with a diploma. That's a single sentence. And long ones like that are all over the place, and it's easy to forget how and where it started by the time you get to the end of it. Yet, Language like that, little beams of smirking insight into the setting and its populace, dot the landscape of this novel so richly. But it becomes work instead of pleasure when you have to explain every joke and quip. The final thing that makes this novel a challenge to teach is the plot itself. If we're being honest, it's pretty trite. I mean, it's essentially a soap opera, or more truly the first telenovela. A love triangle in its, dare I say, purest form? The husband back from the dead, the preacher wrestling with his faith in his heart, the beautiful young woman caught up in the middle but bearing the brunt of it all. It might have been original in 1850, but not so much now. But the characters are great. And while the plot isn't particularly unique, they are somewhat exceptional in their portrayal of the events. I guess we see this all the time in the movies, right? Our great actors are great because they can work with any script. So. Those are the pros and cons, and we'll be addressing them further in our wrap-up episode on The Scarlet Letter. The plan going forward is this. Next week, we'll look at the two main gentlemen of the text, Arthur Dimsdale and Roger Chillingworth. In episode three, we'll focus our lens on Hester Prynne and her impish daughter, Pearl. Then, we'll conclude our discussion of the book in episode four, answering at last whether or not The Scarlet Letter remains relevant to this day. Thank you so much for sitting by the fire with me. Please rate and review the podcast as it makes it easier for others to find. And if you like what you're hearing and intrigued by where it's going, please consider supporting the show on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the canon reviewed. You'll find a few tiers to choose from, including joining a monthly book club, as well as an invite to our discord community. Finally, since this podcast is a conversation as much as anything else, send an email to thecanonreviewed at gmail.com with your thoughts, 
and observations about the works under study. I'll leave you with this passage from the novel. It comes from the chapter called The Leech. Chillingworth is the learned stranger, and these passages detail the manner in which he first encounters Dimsdale. This learned stranger was exemplary, as regarded, at least, the outward forms of a religious life. And, early after his arrival, had chosen for his spiritual guide the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale. The young divine, whose scholar-like renown still lived in Oxford, was considered by his more fervent admirers as little less than a heavenly ordained apostle, destined, should he live and labor for the ordinary term of life, to do as great deeds for the now feeble New England church as the early fathers had achieved for the infancy of the Christian faith. About this period, however, the health of Mr. Dimsdale had evidently begun to fail. By those best acquainted with his habits, the paleness of the young minister's cheek was accounted for by his too earnest devotion to study, his scrupulous fulfillment of parochial duty, and, more than all, by the fasts and vigils of which he made a frequent practice, in order to keep the grossness of this earthly state from clogging and obscuring his spiritual lamp. Such was the young clergyman's condition, and so imminent the prospect that his dawning light would be extinguished, all untimely, when Roger Chillingworth made his advent to the town. His first entry on the scene, few people could tell whence, dropping down as it were out of the sky, or starting from the nether earth, had an aspect of mystery which was easily heightened to the miraculous. He was known to be a man of skill, it was observed that he gathered herbs and the blossoms of wildflowers and dug up roots and plucked up twigs in the forest trees like one acquainted with hidden virtues in what was valueless to the common eye. Why, with such rank in the learned world, had he come hither? What could he, whose sphere was in great cities, be seeking in the wilderness? In answer to this query, a rumor gained ground, and however absurd, was entertained by some very sensible people. That heaven had brought an absolute miracle by transporting an eminent doctor of physics from a German university bodily through the air and setting him down at the door of Mr. Dimsdale's study.